So if you're coming from an object-oriented background, say you've been doing a lot of Java or C Sharp or even C++, uh, one of the surprising parts of Rust is that it doesn't have classes. Uh, you can't have a parent type from which you inherit fields or behavior. Instead, what you have is traits, which look similar to interfaces, but are not quite the same thing. Instead of talking about traits in the abstract, let's jump headfirst into an example. For this video, we'll use the create low HTML. It's a low output latency streaming HTML rewriter slash parser with CSS selector based API. I'm using version 0.2.0 here, which is a year old at this point, and I'm doing that on purpose. Uh, we'll build some stuff with it and later upgrade to 0.3.0, and then we'll run into some interesting problems. So let's do something simple with it. Let's say our input is something like this. The real input is usually much longer. Most of my articles take at least an hour to read. So just imagine there's a lot of markup in between the images. And by default, the web browser will load all the images on a page, regardless of whether they're visible or not. For very long articles with lots of images, that means using up a lot of bandwidth, even if you just read the beginning of the article and decide to close that browser tab instead. At some point, JavaScript will used to work around that by tracking the vertical scrolling position and filling the SRC attribute of image tags as you approach them. Uh, but as of Firefox 75 and Chrome 77, you can now simply set the loading attribute to lazy on those image tags, and it'll do exactly that. No JavaScript involved. So that seems like a pretty good rewrite. Uh, let's do it. Uh, we can build a new HTML rewriter with try new, and it takes two arguments, settings and an output sync. In settings, uh, we add element content handlers based on CSS selectors. Uh, here we'll handle any image tag. And we'll call set attribute to set loading to lazy. Oh, we don't really need any other settings. Uh, as for the output sync, it's a trait, uh, but it's implemented for closure. So all we really need to do is have an output vector here. And then we can simply pass a closure that simply appends the chunk to it. So now that we've got all of that, let's look at what methods HTML rewriter has. Um, we've got a write method that takes a slice of u8s and an end method that acts as a final flush. The reason there's an end method is that low HTML works in a streaming fashion. So a single chunk might not yield a match, for example, if the chunk ends in the middle of an image tag. When we give the next chunk with the other half of the image tag, the rewriter finds a match and proceeds with the replacement. Calling ends simply indicates that there won't be any more chunks, and so there won't be any more opportunities to perform replacements. And any buffered input should simply be copied as is to the output. So as you can see, our program does work. Uh, our input is three simple image tags and our output is those same three image tags, but with the loading attributes set to lazy. Success. Now let's think, what if that's not the only kind of processing we want to do? HTML rewriter is a concrete type, it's a struct. What if we could make a trait instead that exposed the exact same methods? Let's do it. We'll name the trait processor. It's going to have a write method that takes a slice of u8. And an end method. Orphan rules say to implement a trait for a type, you must own either the trait or the type. And by own, I mean have it defined in your own crate. 
So for example, we could not implement the display trait, which we don't own, on the HTML rewriter struct, which we also don't own. We could make a new struct and implement display on that, or we could make a new trait and implement it on any type we like. And because our crate defines the processor trait here, we can implement it for any type we like, like HTML rewriter, for example. HTML rewriter is generic over a lifetime and a type parameters, which must implement output sync. So let's make sure we have all the bounds we need. Now, for example, we can make a process function that takes an input stir and a mutable reference to a processor trait object. It's a pretty contrived example, but just imagine that those processors are part of a larger content pipeline and we really want to be able to feed input through any type of processor. So I've changed our example program to use that and yeah, it still works. Now it's pretty pointless to have a trait if we're only going to have one type implementing it. So let's make another processor. We'll put in the uh, HTML escape crate, which uh, turns characters like the less than sign, which would normally indicate the start of an HTML tag into an HTML entity like ampersand LT semicolon. HTML escape exposes functions, not structs, because it's stateless. Uh, because we need the type to implement processor on, let's make an escaper struct. Let's get an output field of type W that implements stdio write. Now we can implement the processor trade for escaper. There's a small hiccup here um, because encode save to writer takes a string slice rather than a byte slice. Uh, that means we need to call from ETF8 first. And that could fail uh, if the byte slice ends in the middle of a multi-byte sequence. Luckily, we're doing proper error reporting here, so it's not that bad. But just in case this code ends up in production later, let's add a comment uh, for future maintainers. And now we have two types that implement processor. So we can call our process method again on the output of the first processor to get HTML escaped output. And this will be handy if we want to show HTML code as part of an HTML page, for example. So I ran into a fun problem while writing this. A mutable slice actually implements write. If you just pass the mutable slice because the vector is empty, uh, that means there's literally zero room in the buffer to write anything. And so what we want to do instead is just pass a mutable reference to the vector, which also implements write, but it knows how to grow. And so now it should work. There we go. Uh, look at all these HTML entities, so cute. So at the beginning of the video, I said I was using an older version of LOL HTML on purpose and that I'd explain later. Well, later is now. That version of LOL HTML has a design flaw, in my opinion. The AND method only takes a mutable reference to self. And that means nothing in the type system is preventing us from calling it twice. What happens if we do, actually? It panics. In a way, this is fine. Like, it's not unsafe. 
but it's needlessly error prone. Like instead of checking for that invariant at runtime, we could be checking for it at compile time if only the end method was taking ownership of self instead of taking the immutable reference. And that's exactly what lowhtml 0.3.0 is doing. So let's upgrade real quick and we'll see what kind of compile errors we get. Uh, so first of all, uh, try new has been renamed to new and it can no longer fail. That's an easy change. Uh, second, our implementation of processor for HTML rewriter no longer works because all we have is a mutable reference to self and now we need to pass ownership of self. So what can we do? Well, we can change the signature of the end method in our processor trait to match the signature of HTML rewriter's end method like so. And now we can no longer call rewriter.and twice which is something I love about Rust's type system. If you design your types carefully, you can prevent entire classes of bugs in ways that are impossible or extremely awkward in other languages. So let's remove the extraneous call and see if it still works. Yeah, it does. But there's a bug in our code. See, when we use HTML rewriter, uh, we pass it to process which calls write, and then we call end ourselves. But when we use escaper, we pass it to process, which calls write, and then we never call end. This is actually fine because uh, escaper's end method is a no-op, but that's not the contract of the uh, processor trait. We're supposed to always call end before we use the output, something that is not currently enforced by the type system. We could think about how to make that impossible to forget, but for now, because we always call our processors through the process method here, uh, let's just call end from here. Uh-oh, that doesn't work. Um, well, there's a couple ways to fix that. Uh, the issue here is that the process method is taking a mutable reference to a trade object. All we know about that object is that it implements the processor interface, and that's it. There's only one instance, one copy of the process method in the resulting binary, and it works for any type that implements the processor trait, which means we don't generate code specific to each type a uh, process is called with. And to call the end method, we need to move self into it. And to move something, we must know how big it is. You can think of it as doing a mem copy to somewhere, uh, even though there's optimizations under the hood that can turn that into something more efficient. If we want to be able to call end, one thing we can do is to have process be generic over a type parameter P, which has to implement processor. Because we have to be able to move out of processor uh, in order to call end, we also need to take ownership of it instead of just a mutable reference. And suddenly things start working again. But let's go a little further. What if we want a method that can return any processor? Say we maybe have um, an enum called processor type. It has two variants, lazy loading and HTML escape. And let's say that enum has a build method that returns either type of processor. So we're getting a bunch of errors here. Uh, it's telling us trait objects must include the din keyword. Uh, that's a hard error as of Rust 2021 edition. It's also telling us that match arms have incompatible types. So cargo check is telling us to add a din keyword before this trait. So let's see if that'll help. It's also telling us that the trait sized must be implemented for din processor. Uh, so let's try adding a bound on the trait. After all, both HTML rewriter and escaper are size types. So this should work just fine. 
Now that we have a sized bound on processor, we can no longer make it into a trade object. How do we fix that? Well, really, we don't have that many choices here. We can't return a trait. We could return an enum that implements that trait. That's called enum dispatch, and it's wicked fast. But say we don't care about performance as much. In that case, we can simply return a boxed trait object, just like our methods have been returning a result containing the boxed in error. What that effectively means is that the concrete type will be moved from the stack or registers to the heap, and what we're passing around is simply a pointer to the heap. Pointers are always the same size on any given architecture, so there's no need to worry about the size constraint anymore. So let's change the return type to boxed in processor instead. Ah. Uh, it still can't be made into an object. Well, we shouldn't need size anymore, so let's just remove that. And that should make our trait object safe again. So because output sync does not expect to ever fail, uh, what we're going to do is just unwrap that error here, and that should match with the closure implementation. Ugh. We're not done, are we? Well, to be fair, we're looking for trouble. We're returning a processor that uses a value of type W, uh, and here's a gotcha that surprises everyone. There's an invisible lifetime bound right here. Um, let's see if the compiler diagnostics that can explain that for us. Parameter type W may not live long enough. Consider adding an explicit lifetime bound here. So we could do that. We could try that. The problem with this is that whatever we're gonna pass into here as the output is definitely not gonna have the static lifetime. So instead, what we wanna do is just introduce a new lifetime parameter. And make sure that whatever the function returns also has the same lifetime as the output that we've passed as a parameter. Well, we did it, we're all done, uh, except we never actually called build or use its result. So let's refactor main to use our new processor factory. Ah, more errors. Sorry, more diagnostics. Rusty is just trying to help. Hmm. It says here that process wants a type that implements processor, but instead we're giving it a box din processor, which does not implement processor. I guess that's true. The proper way to do this is to implement processor for box T, for any T that implements processor. Simply delegating like this works for the write method, but it doesn't work for the end method. T colon colon end takes a self, and all we have is a box self because of this up here. So we need to dereference self to move self out of the box. But then we have more errors uh, at the call site this time. It says the size for values of type DIN processor cannot be known at compilation time because the trait size is not implemented for DIN processor. Okay, well, let's just uh, relax that bound then. We'll add plus question mark sized, which means don't require sized. So now the call sites are happy, but our end method broke again, because now we can't move out of the box because we can go from a pointer to the heap to holding that value on the stack, because in order to do that, we would need to know how big the value is. And we just said we didn't need to know how big the value is because we don't require sized. So how do we get out of this one? Well. You may not like this, but this is what peak trade object safety looks like. Uh, if we simply change the signature of processor n to take box self instead of self, all our problems go away. So I've made a few adjustments to the implementation for HTML Rewriter and for Escaper, and I've also gotten this one to work, but do we really want to do that? I mean, I think we may not need that implementation at all anymore because we're gonna need self to be boxed if we wanna call end, and we do wanna call end. So we can simply have our process function take a boxed in processor and then we're home free.
Oh, we can even remove that last impl. Wait, no, last minute error. Uh, output does not live long enough. Uh, I thought we fixed this. Wait, we introduced a new box in the process function. Does that one also have an implicit static bound? Yes, Rusty shows us the uh, the call site for the process, saying that casting escaper from boxed in processor plus anonymous lifetime to whatever process wants requires output to be borrowed for static. Again, we can either introduce a lifetime parameter, just like we did before, or just use lifetime elision. And now everything works again. So now you know everything, except how to squeeze some extra performance out of this. Because we're now using a box to trade object, two things are happening. Things are moved to and from the heap. You can think of it as calling malloc, memcopy, memcopy again, and then free, regardless of how it's actually implemented for your platform. And the second thing that happens is whenever we call a method on that box to trade object, there's an additional level of indirection. The call first looks into a V table, a virtual table, which points to the actual implementation for the concrete type stored in the box, and then calls it. That's like super fine most of the time. Don't go changing it until you can prove that it's a performance problem, which is a very common pitfall when you're picking up Rust because there's always a way to do fewer allocations, use statically check references instead of doing reference counting, avoid heap allocations and avoid dynamic dispatch. Folks often feel like they have to. Well, you don't have to. You have my blessing to not drive yourself into the ground chasing absolute performance. But if you must, if you've measured performance and that's the only thing you can think of to make performance better, then you can do this. First, let's change our trade back to take self and adjust our various implementations as well. Let's also make process generic again. So now all the call sites for the process are failing again because boxed in processor does not implement processor. Well, we don't want to do any boxing anyway. We want to do enum dispatch. So we need processor type colon colon build to return a concrete type. Let's call it processor impl. Just like processor type, we're going to have two variants, one for lazy loading and one for HTML escape. Both those types are generic, so I guess let's add some type parameters without thinking too much and, and see if it becomes a problem later. Okay, and let's change build to return a processor impl instead of a boxed trade object. And instead of calling box new, we're just going to build either variant of our processor impl enum. There. Not. Now the compiler complains that our type parameter O is not constrained by anything. And it is correct. It doesn't depend on any input to processor type build or the processor type type itself. It depends on the code inside of here, inside of that build methods. And so they can't be type parameters on processor type. So how do we solve this? Well, we can make O a concrete type, uh, but first let's take care of H. It's just a lifetime of the handlers themselves because you can borrow stuff from element content handlers but we're not actually borrowing anything, so we can just make that static. W is actually fine because it does depend on a parameter to the build method and it is used by HTML escape, so that, that part's fine. O is more annoying. Because we're using a closure, this is actually a function type. And unfortunately, function types cannot be named. So we could use a box function, but we're specifically on a quest to avoid boxing, so let's not. 
Instead, we can just make a concrete type, let's say a writer output sync. Then we'll just implement output sync on writer output sync, which we can do because we don't own the trade, but we own the struct. So now that we have that, we can remove the O type parameter and just replace it with our concrete type up here. Of course, we can't use a closure anymore. Now we have to make a writer output sync. Now at that point, the only thing that remains is implementing the processor trait for processor impl. And we're done. Uh, there's no dynamic dispatch involved anymore. Well, we do jump to different code paths based on the enums discriminant, but that's less costly than doing a method call through a trade object. How do I know? Well, because there's a crate named enum dispatch that says so. In fact, let's see if we can use it to simplify our code. We can. How nice. Uh, the enum dispatch trait also implements from for any of the concrete types covered by the enum, uh, which means we can simplify the build method as well. We don't need to build those variants uh, explicitly. We can just call into. And that's about all I have to show you today. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learned something. If you did, please click the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. It's always a bit hard for me to strike the right balance between approachable and in-depth. Uh, hopefully there's something for everyone in there. I'd like to thank my patrons for their continued support throughout the making of these videos. Y'all are at the best. If you'd like to support my work as well, you can donate five or $10 a month on patreon.com slash faster than lime. It helps a great deal. Until next time, please take care. It's a weird time we live in. A time where people will keep listening to the end of a video all the way through the entire list of Patreon supporters. Scary stuff. Please give yourself some time to process everything that's going on and get yourself something nice whenever you can. Okay, bye.